in there and make references uh, Senator to Hanson, Senator Hanson, Senator McKim, resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McKim, resume your seat. Senator Hanson, we certainly do not refer to senators in that way, but it being 2 p.m., we will now move to questions uh, without notice. There are a bunch Senator, of responses. Senator Hanson. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Two of Mr. Morrison's closest friends, Scott Briggs and David Gazard, were handpicked by the Morrison government to receive $80,000 of taxpayer money without any tender process to start up their own private sector quarantine business, Quarantine Services Australia. On their website, Mr. Briggs and Mr. Gazard boast of their close personal relationship with Mr. Morrison, sharing articles which say the pair are, quote, as about as close to the Prime Minister's inner circle as you can get, and revealing that Mr. Gazard, quote, speaks to the PM daily. Has Mr. Morrison ever spoken with either Scott Briggs or David Gazard about a private sector quarantine proposal? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Keneally for her question, uh, albeit it's another example of the mud raking and throwing that those opposite seek to engage in. Mr President, the answer to the last part of the question, to the best part of my knowledge, is no, never. If there is anything to update in relation to that, I will check and provide it to the Chamber. But that is certainly my understanding because the Prime Minister had no involvement whatsoever in the decision of the Department of Home Affairs to award that contract. No involvement. The contract decision was entirely a matter for the Department of Home Affairs. As the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs himself made clear to Senator Keneally at estimates on the 25th of October, the engagement and the contract had nothing to do with ministers, their staff, or their offices and was personally overseen and managed by the department. Senate order. Senator McAllister. Senator Keneally, you have the call. A supplementary question. Thank you. According to a report by Sky News, Home Affairs Secretary Michael Pizzullo reportedly told business leaders that the Quarantine Services Australia deal was, quote, a really important project for the Prime Minister. Given this is a really important project for the Prime Minister, has Mr Morrison recused himself from any and all Cabinet discussions about the proposal? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, um, uh, the answer effectively is yes, uh, Mr President. Um, uh, however, uh, as I said, as I said Order. earlier, that is, that is only once he became even aware of the fact that anything existed in relation to discussions. Because, Mr. President, Mr. President, Order. Mr. President, these, this contract, this matter, was all, as I said before, executed by the department, by the department, without any engagement by the Prime Minister. Or ministers. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Can the minister confirm on what date the Prime Minister recused himself from any and all cabinet discussions in relation to Quarantine Services Australia? Minister. I'll take that on notice, Mr. President, but again reiterate uh, that in terms of uh, the uh, contract and the engagement there, that was a matter undertaken by the department with no discussion, uh, approval or otherwise, and by the Prime Minister. We'll now go to Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on the achievements of Australians throughout 2021 and how this Liberal National Government has had a plan to support Australian families and businesses throughout the challenges of COVID-19 this year. Oh, sorry. Call the minister, Minister Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Small uh, for his question 
And in thanking Senator Small, uh, I want to in particular uh, thank uh, all Australians uh, who we are indebted and grateful to for all they have done throughout 2021 as a nation to stand together, uh, particularly in the face of the once in a century global pandemic that our nation and the world has been grappling with, which has resulted in the largest economic shock to the world since the Great Depression. Australians have demonstrated their resilience and they should be congratulated and thanked for the efforts they have made, including coming out in droves to get vaccinated. More than 39 million doses administered nationally, more than 92 per cent of the eligible population over 16 having had a first dose and more than 87 per cent now having had a second dose. COVID continues to be an enormous challenge right around the world. Only a few months ago, the Delta strain was wreaking havoc here, as it has across so many nations as the dominant variant. But lockdowns and restrictions put in place uh, have helped to save lives and livelihoods alongside the strong economic policies and support measures that have been in place. Australia has fared far better than much of the rest of the world. On a per capita basis, the UK and USA have had over 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. By avoiding death rates such as in OECD nations, we've managed to save over 30,000 lives. We've also fared far better than most countries on the economic front. Whilst we saw a contraction in the September quarter, this was during the period of the lockdowns across New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. But our economy has been roaring back. Job ads are more than 30 per cent higher than they were at the start of the pandemic. In fact, they're at a 12-year high. More than 350,000 jobs have come back since the start of September. We're on a pathway to see unemployment at or below 5 per cent for a sustained period. Only the second time that's happened in 50 years. That's the strength and that's thanks to the hard work of Australians. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Birmingham, how do the efforts of Australians in rolling up their sleeves to make Australia one of the most highly vaccinated nations in the world provide us with the confidence to safe, safely reopen, stay safely open and live with the virus as we look ahead to 2022? Minister. Mr President, our national plan for reopening that the Prime Minister drove and ensured we had the expertise of the Doherty Institute to underpin and took through National Cabinet has relied upon Australians rolling up their sleeves to get vaccinated, and we thank them for doing that. In fact, they've become champions at it, delivering such high, globally high uh, vaccine rates across Australia. It is this that makes possible the safe reopening across our country. It's the incredible outcome made possible by all of the health workers and those who have both risked their lives to help people suffering from COVID-19 but also helping to protect us all through the rollout of the vaccination program. That journey is not over. We are now one of the first countries in the world to roll out a comprehensive nationwide booster program to make sure people can be as safe and as protected as possible. We've got access to more than 151 million additional doses and the boosters will be freely available to anyone who is fully vaccinated. This is something we can all look forward to Minister, in 2022. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Small, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will this government's plan continue to provide the confidence to sustain our economic recovery? And indeed, what are the risks to a stronger and brighter future for all Australians in 2022? Minister. Mr President, we entered this pandemic from a position of economic strength, having brought the budget back to the point of balance for the first time in 11 years. This provided us with the fiscal artillery to be able to respond comprehensively throughout the pandemic with $311 billion in direct economic and health support. JobKeeper, the coronavirus supplement, record business tax incentives to drive more investment through the economy, introducing and extending temporary full expensing and loss carryback arrangements. All of them have helped to ensure that our economy gets through COVID strongly and comes out of it strongly. At the same time, $10.2 billion in tax relief flowed to 11.5 million Australians just during the September quarter, the largest tax cuts to flow in a single quarter in 20 years. We may have been able to do all of this because we've stuck to our plan, kept our economy strong, kept Australian businesses strong, and the world can only but wonder what it would have been like had the Labor Party and their higher taxes been there instead Minister, of the actions that we Minister, have taken to keep time such has strength. Expired. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Mr Morrison claimed that Liberal Party ads aired during the national bushfire emergency were simply communicating government policy decisions, despite being authorised by the Liberal Party and the host page, including a donation button. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, um, all, parties, uh, all parties communicate uh, policies and messages uh, on behalf of uh, their uh, MPs and their representatives uh, and promote and communicate uh, those messages. There's nothing unusual uh, about that. Uh, and indeed, using as many communication channels as is possible to get those messages out is the appropriate thing uh, to be doing uh, for all of us. Your party does it, our party does it, others do it. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Order. Mr Order. Morrison claimed that he had a comprehensive conversation with Zoe Salucci McDermott, a bushfire victim in Cabago. But video footage showed that the only words he said to her were, I understand, I understand, while he turned his back to her and walked away. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr President, uh, I, I have faced enough opposition questions now to, uh, to know that the context of them can sometimes be uh, distorted in terms of what the quotes that might be being used are uh, or the basis upon which those quotes uh, are being used. Um, it, is, of course, it is, of course, evidence, as I said when I rose in response to the very first question today, uh, that, yet again, those opposite don't come in here to ask policy questions. They don't come in here to ask questions about uh, the issues facing Australians in their jobs, their lives, uh, the tax they might pay, uh, the threats indeed that uh, they might face, be they uh, domestic or foreign, or any of those types of challenges. No, they come in uh, just with an agenda uh, of muckraking, of mud throwing. Order. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Ayres. I mean, self-evidently it's relevance. The, the, the question Are you rising was about why he made a claim that wasn't true. And he hasn't remotely approached that question. Minister, Minister I will bring you back to the question. Uh, you have the call. You have 16 seconds remaining. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I, I don't accept the premise of the Senator's question in, uh, in, uh, in relation uh, to the assertions he makes. Uh, Mr President, on this side, uh, we're going to proudly continue to not engage in that sort of muckraking, but focus outside of this building on Australians, their jobs, Minister, their families, Minister, their lives, and helping to make them— Your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary question. Mr Morrison claimed that he took the bushfire preparedness advice of former fire commissioners, but they say he ignored their meeting requests for months and rejected urgent funding requests. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? Does Mr Morrison still maintain that he has never told a lie in public life? Minister. Uh, Mr. Po Mr President, I'm, I'm sure he does, and I'm sure he does uh, because he engages comprehensively across public life in Australia with Australians from all walks of life. And I know uh, that the Prime Minister uh, is looking forward uh, to not spending so much of his time uh, in this building, uh, answering Order. these types of grubby questions, but that is looking Order. forward to returning to the ability to get out there and talk to Order, real Australians, and talk to real Senator Australians about our job creation policies, talk to real Australians about those policies that have created those 350,000 jobs since September, talk to real Australians about the record numbers of new apprenticeship commencements lately, talk to real Australians about the more than 300,000 people who have been, who've been helped into their first home as a result of the new home ownership policies our government has implemented, Scott Morrison has championed. Talk to them about what they're doing with the tax cuts that they've received and how they're using them to get ahead as a family. Minister, That's what we'll be doing Minister, for real Australians. Your time has expired. Senator Cox. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Minister Rustin. The International Energy Agency said we cannot open up not even one more new coal, oil or gas project to meet net zero by 2050. Under the National Gas Infrastructure Plan announced last week, the Morrison government wants to open up three massive new gas basins and up to 11 gas pipelines. This, pl 
plan for massive gas expansion locks in the devastating global heating and pushes 1.5 de degrees beyond reach. Minister, can you, you can't— Continue, Senator Cox. Order on my right. Minister, you can't implement the National Gas Infrastructure Plan and meet net zero by 2050. Which one do you choose? The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Cox uh, for her question. Well, Senator Cox, I actually have to disagree with your yeah. uh, assessment of uh, the ability to yeah. be able to deliver the National Gas Infrastructure Plan um, at the same time as meeting uh, the targets that we committed internationally uh, to, uh, to make sure that we achieve a net zero by 2050. Uh, so, in the absolute express answer and explicit answer to your question is, I do believe that both are achievable simultaneously. But what I can also add to Order. that, Senator Cox, uh, through you, Mr. President, is that this government absolutely remains committed to meeting all of its uh, commitments, all of its targets, and all of its promises to Australia. And that includes making sure that we deliver affordable and reliable energy to support the economy to support the economy so that the economy supports jobs and so that jobs are available for Australians so that they can have the opportunity to be able to access uh, the opportunities that are presented by our resource sector going into the future. But we also absolutely are committed to meeting our targets. I mean, our track record so far as a government in terms of meeting targets that have previously been agreed to is exceptional. We meet our targets and we exceed our targets. And, and there is every possibility uh, that you know, we will continue to do that. We certainly are intending to exceed our targets as we go through 2030. So, Senator Cox, um, through you, Mr Chair, um, we are, as a government, absolutely committed to the delivery of the National Gas Infrastructure structure plan Order. because it is absolutely imperative to rural and regional Australia, the jobs, Order. the businesses Senator and the economies McKim. of people that live outside the capital cities, and I know most of you live in capital cities, but this is a program that not only supports all Australians, allows Australians to be able to benefit from the wealth of the resources that sit under our ground, but it supports our regional communities, their economies and the jobs for people that live in regional Australia, and I would have thought that that's what you would have wanted Minister. too. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Uh, WA Premier Mark McGowan has said that he would do whatever it takes to come to Woodside's aid if it loses the upcoming Supreme Court case over the Scarborough project. Minister, will you also be supporting the blanket protection of the gas industry offered up by the West Australian Premier? Minister. Order. Thank, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, what this government will continue to do is to provide the appropriate protections to yeah, yeah. all Australian yeah, businesses yeah. that are afforded through the extraordinary amount of regulation that's put in place to make sure that we have a balanced response, but we also protect uh, our f our the future of this country. And the resource sector Order. provides Australia with an amazing opportunity for, for our growth and our wealth and a responsible way of extracting those resources to the benefit of all Australians is what this government will do. But we have in place extraordinary regulation and extraordinary regulators to make sure it's done in a way that is appropriate, that doesn't damage our environment, but at the same time provides the economic development that Australia and all Australians deserve to be able to benefit from, which is our amazing resources sector. Uh, and, uh, and through you, Mr Chair, Senator Cox, um, rural and regional Australia has lived off the sheep's back and out of the resources that come out of our ground for many years, and it will continue Minister, to do so. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cox, a second supplementary. How does the government intend to offset the astronomical scale of emissions from Scarborough and the Beedaloo gas projects? Because to everyone else, this is simply not believable. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I, I think you know the, the statement um, that Senator Cox just made um, is is uh, is completely inaccurate, and I completely refute it. I don't believe everybody uh, believes the, the statement that you've just put forward to the chamber, Senator Cox. In fact, I think that most reasonable Australians actually understand uh, that that you know Order. good governments actually can balance out 
the, uh, making sure that we look after our, uh, our environment, but at the same time making sure that our economy is strong because a strong economy supports all Australians, uh, and that includes people that live in rural and regional Australia as well as those that live in the city. But we know that our gas-fired recovery is extremely important for Australia. We will do it in a responsible way that doesn't damage the environment, and, and, but we will not do it in a way that damages Australian businesses, puts jobs on the line and Senator Rice, on a point of order. Point of order on, on relevance. Senator Cox's question was very clear. How are you going to offset the emissions? Uh, I, I, was, uh, I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I believe the minister was uh, being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, to the interjection uh, or the point of order, the same way we always do, Senator uh, Rice, and that is responsibly and via a regulated yeah. mechanism. Order. Thank you, Minister. And we now go to Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and relates to the implementation of the AUKUS agreement. Isn't it the case that to implement transfers of nuclear material to fuel any Australian nuclear submarine, it will be necessary for Australia to conclude a specific arrangement with the International Atomic Energy Agency in accordance with Article 14 of our 1974 Nuclear Safeguards Agreement with the IAEA. Isn't it a fact that in more than 40 years in which the IAEA have been implementing uh, comprehensive nuclear safeguard agreements, the agency has never concluded a paragraph 14 agreement? Uh, isn't this uh, required agreement unpre unprecedented? Isn't it the case that the approval by the IAEA Board of Governors will be required for the agency to agree to a paragraph 14 agreement with Australia. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Patrick, for uh, your question. And there are a number of um, issues that you have raised in that question. I'll try and canvas uh, as many of them uh, as I can. Uh, in the first instance, can I say that Australia has uh, been uh, very strongly engaged with the IAEA since the uh, notification since the announcement of uh, AUKUS itself. We uh, uh, notified the IAEA uh, as soon as the announcement occurred. The Prime Minister himself met with Director General Grossi on the 2nd of November. Importantly, Mr President, Australia comes to this table uh, absolutely steadfast in our support of the nuclear non-proliferation regime and its cornerstone, the NPT. Uh, there is no change to our status as a non-nuclear weapon state, and we will comply with our obligations under the NPT. In fact, we have one of the best nuclear weapons non-proliferation reputations in the world. I can go to that further, um, Mr President, but let me also record for the record that neither the NPT nor Australia's Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement with the IAEA prohibit naval nuclear pro proliferation. Uh, we aim to set the highest possible non-proliferation standard and strengthen the integrity, indeed, of the non-proliferation architecture. Australia delivered a trilateral statement with the United Kingdom and the United States during the IAEA Board of Governors meeting last week uh, from the 24th to the 26th of November. That statement emphasised that Australia does not and will not seek nuclear weapon weapons, our willingness and intent to proceed in an open and consultative manner, especially regarding issues of nuclear material, facilities and, and activities relevant to the IAEA. Our cooperation will be fully consistent with the three parties' respective non-proliferation obligations and that this cooperation will be pursued in a, matter, in a manner that preserves the integrity of the non-proliferation regime. As is publicly known, Minister, many of the program's Minister, specifics have yet to be determined Minister, across the next 18 months period. Your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question? Thank you, Minister. Uh, last week, Australian Ambassador Richard Sadler uh, sought to persuade the uh, IAEA board that consideration of AUKUS is premature. The board, at China's initiative, agreed to include the transfer of nuclear materials in the context of AUKUS and, and nuclear safeguards as an agenda item. Mr Sadler argued China's proposal to establish a spe special committee to look at AUKUS issues would politicise board deliberations. Is China trying to politicise these board deliberations? Minister. 
Uh, Mr. President, uh, in relation to uh, whether the, the matter does or does not become an agenda item, uh, our trilateral statement noted uh, that a board agenda item addressing safeguards related to an Australian nuclear-powered submarine program is premature. When there are significant developments to report and in the interests of transparency, we are happy uh, indeed, very keen to update the board in the future under the AOB as we intended to do at this meeting. The statement also noted that there have been some mischaracterisations of the AUKUS partnership and Australia's acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines, and it clarified those. So I don't entirely agree with Senator Patrick's uh, description of Ambassador Sadlier's approach, but that is, uh, that is the way in which uh, the matter was dealt with uh, on the agenda, uh, Mr. President. Can I I say that uh, we have seen willful disinformation in relation to uh, the AUKUS announcement from a number of parties, and that disinformation um, compounds Minister, multiple Minister, offences of a similar nature Minister, this year. Your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a second supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how concerned are you that China and Russia will seek to obstruct uh, IAEA board approval of the safeguard arrangements that will be required to implement? the AUKUS nuclear submarine program. Are you concerned that AUKUS will be hostage to other issues on the IAEA agenda, Iran's nuclear ambitions and what to do with North Korea? What is your diplomatic strategy to overcome these risks? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Patrick for his uh, supplementary question. We expect all members of the IAEA board uh, and, in fact, members of the international community to act responsibly, uh, to engage in the uh, accurate, uh, uh, accurate dissemination of information, not disinformation or misinformation for that matter. That goes to these matters, Mr President, and, of course, many others, as I have stated repeatedly during the pandemic in particular, uh, and this is no exception. In relation to the IAEA, we will uh, continue to work transparently and openly within it and with the IAEA. We will engage in the, uh, in, with the IAEA in a manner that is consistent with the established rules and practices of the IAEA. Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom will not be playing political games which undermine that very architecture. We know that it goes to the heart of the importance of this process and we intend to work within that constructively, openly and transparently. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberals and the Nationals in government are delivering for regional Australia to provide confidence for small business and families for a stronger future in 2022? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Davey, for your question and your strong advocacy uh, for the regions. Mr President, the Liberal and National governments are the only governments that can deliver for regional Australia because, after all, we are the most in touch with the millions of Australians who actually live and work in these beautiful parts of our nation. Many of us on both the Liberal Party and the Nationals actually live and raise our families in these regions. Not the Greens, I must say, uh, who do their very best every single day in this place to shut down sustainable, best practice rural industries like forestry every single day, there are, or the Labor Party, who continually turn their backs on blue collar workers slogging it out in our mining, resources and manufacturing industries. It is the Liberal and Nationals who have the track record of delivering for regional Australia and will continue to Order. do so. Based on the current investments Senator and previous investments our governments have made, we'll be providing over $100 billion to the regions to 2030. Over 2021, we've delivered a multitude of programs that have supported regional Australia in infrastructure, telecommunications, health, education, Order. agriculture, tourism and resources sector. Senator We're supporting local businesses to create Ayers. jobs. More than 2,500 Australians have been employed in constructing the inland rail alone, which has seen more than 400 companies across the nation share in over $2.2 billion worth of contract for supplying. And we haven't stopped there. 
we're about getting people, produce and products where they are needed. The success of the regions that we're currently experiencing accelerated under COVID-19 didn't just happen. It took hard work and on-the-ground leadership. It's a direct result of the entrepreneurial spirit, the drive of the local people, infrastructure investment and government policy to connect regional Australia to enable our products to reach markets across the globe. And we wouldn't have all gotten through this year had it not been for our farmers, truckies, doctors, nurses, community pharmacists, teachers Minister, and emergency Minister, service personnel. Your time has expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And I too acknowledge that we got through the year on the back of regional industries. Uh, what is the government doing to ensure those living in rural and regional Australia will have access to quality 21st century telecommunications? Minister. Well, Senator Davey, Order. I can. As part of the Liberal National Government's wi wider regionalisation agenda, we want to see people living and working out in the regions, especially across northern Australia. We, but to do that, you actually have to have access to 21st century telecommunication, particularly the type of telecommunications that's taken for granted uh, by those people living in cities. And I, our government wants to make that transition easy uh, by increasing their digital experience. Connectivity helps regional businesses grow, creating jobs. It helps people in regional Australia to work remotely. It dissolves the distance. And today I was pleased to launch the second round of the regional connectivity program that supports unique place-based connectivity solutions to the tune of $112 uh, million dollars. $45 million of that will be quarantined for projects uh, to unlock that potential of Northern Australia. And it was great to stand and make that announcement with a champion for Northern Australia, uh, Matt Canavan. Under round one of the program, uh, we saw Minister, so many... Pro oh. Minister, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Davey, a second supplementary. Too much good things to say. Um, given the high risk weather season that is currently upon us, how is our government ensuring that telecommunications in regional and rural Australia is adequate and resilient in times of need to keep people safe and connected? Minister. Firstly, I'd like to thank the thousand of first responders and volunteers who do so much for Australia and Australians at our time of need. And without them, uh, we would be in a very, very different place. And right now, we've got the floods in New South Wales. Uh, first responders have received over 5,000 calls and uh, have assisted in over 140 rescues uh, through this period. We know that increased connectivity can save lives, and because of our mobile black spot program alone that we've rolled out since coming to government, nearly 68,000 calls have been made to triple zero that wouldn't have been able to be made by regional Australians. That's real evidence that we're helping to save lives and livelihoods. Our government is delivering over $37 million to prevent, mitigate and manage telecommunication outages in natural disasters through our STAND program. That extends the battery backup uh, to our mobile black swap program, better telecommunications for our rural and country fire service, depots and evacuation centres is one way Minister, we can say thank you to Minister, our first responders. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. It was revealed publicly today that when Liberal MP Bridget Archer told Mr Morrison's office that she was considering voting against the cashless debit card, two senior members of his staff literally stood over her in her office. Ms Archer spoke against the cashless welfare card legislation, then abstained from voting. Ms Archer has said that she felt bullied threatened and intimidated by these Order. staffers for almost two weeks. Is Mr Morrison aware of who the staff are? The, the order, order, order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Senator, uh, thanks, Mr President, and I thank Senator McCarthy uh, for the question. Um, the member for Bass is, uh, is somebody who I consider to be a good friend and I know is a powerful advocate for her community and she brings um, strong principles and strong opinions to this place, like many uh, on this side of the chamber and all across the chamber, uh, brings strong principles and strong opinions in, uh, in their service. Uh, now, like all parties, like all parties uh, obviously when people are looking to differ, uh, then discussions are had uh, ideally around those differences. In our side, 
ultimately, as Ms Archer did on that occasion, she was free as a Liberal Party MP to not necessarily vote. Oh, uh, Minister. On relevance, uh, the question is directly on is Mr Morrison aware of who the staff are? I, I, I have been listening to the minister. I'm not uh, prepared to uh, uh, rule that he was not being directly relevant. I'm listening carefully. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, as I was saying, all parties would, you would expect to have those discussions. Uh, uh, in the Labor Party, if you were having such a discussion, uh, it would, of course, be an expulsion discussion. In our party, if you're having such a discussion... Minister, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong on the point of order. Uh, yeah, point of order. I, I, it is a point of direct relevance. Um, uh, and this is... Uh, these are the, Senator McCarthy asked about public reports that Ms Archer said she felt bullied, threatened and intimidated by Prime Minister or staffers prior to the vote. So I, I, put, I put it to you that uh, a, a reference to what happens after a vote is actually not relevant to the question. This is about activity or behaviour by alleged behaviour by prime ministerial staff in the lead up to a vote. Senator Canavan, on the point you, of order. Thank you, Chair. Just on the point of order, that's not what the. Uh, minister was saying. He was clearly talking about the discussions that would happen before a vote, as he mentioned, an expulsion discussion. That would be the case in the Labor Party. Comparing the question clearly goes to the appropriateness of discussions around a vote and therefore bringing in how that would be dealt with in other political parties, with other senators and members of this place, is clearly relevant to that question. I'm, I, I, Senator Wong, order. Order. The Sen Senator Wong has had the opportunity to bring the minister back to the question. Uh, at, I'm listening carefully to the answer. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, the, the point purely that I was making is that uh, robust discussions are had in this place. They're had right here in the chambers about people's position in relation to bills and votes. Uh, they're had in offices across the building about people's positions in relation to bills and votes. Uh, only one side of politics has uh, a structural threat Order. in place as part of their rules uh, that says you know, very clearly in terms of what the threat is, if you go against us, you're out of here. That is not what happens in our party, but of course discussions Order. are had, Mr President. Order. I will not give Senator McCarthy the call until there is order in the chamber. Order. Senator Gallagher. Senator McCarthy, you have the call for a supplementary question. Uh, with allegations of bullying, threats and intimidation of one of his female MPs by his own staff having now been made public, what action has Mr Morrison taken? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, Mr, Mr Morrison has made clear uh, his respect for, uh, for the member for Bass, his support for her uh, and, uh, and very much uh, his, uh, his ongoing engagement and discussions with her. Order. Um, you know, once again, as has been the case through many of the questions I face today, and it's not uncommon, um, what is put to me as assertions or direct quotes are not always uh, completely direct quotes uh, that, uh, that apply. Order. Mr President, as I've made clear, okay, discussions you would expect happen between party leaders and their members or senators and their officers. These are commonplace across the building. Uh, of course, you can have strong disagreements. They should be done respectfully. That's the way the Prime Minister always expects them to be conducted. Senator Order. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary question. Mr President, Brittany Higgins, Grace Tame, Christine Holgate, Bridget Archer, Julia Banks, Gladys Berejiklian and Zoe Salucci McDermott. Why have Order. all of these women publicly complained about Mr Morrison's behaviour and attitudes towards women? Minister. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I don't accept the premise of all of that aspect of the question. I know there are many names you mentioned there, uh, many individuals who have been very courageous in public statements that they have made and who have played a role during the Order. course of this year, in particular in relation to driving some of the change that we have discussed and that the Prime Minister has discussed very clearly this week. The Prime Minister has made clear that change is necessary Order. in the parliament uh, to ensure we have the reforms that are necessary the reforms that are necessary for this place to operate effectively in the future. But, you know, Mr President, there's all manner of conduct that could do with improvement at times, and we want to make sure those reforms occur to drive that change. Uh, but frankly, you know, conduct elsewhere in terms of uh, the type of smearing, Order. the type of scaring and so on that those opposite like to engage in could also do with helping to lift. It's you know, oh, well. I, I, I reckon when you go out deliberately trying to scare Australia's pensioners, Senator Wong, when you go out trying oh, to deliberately da. scare Australia's pensioners, as oh, you like to do election after an election with many scare, pensioner scare, it's pretty obvious Minister. you're out to try to threaten Minister. or intimidate them. The too. time for the answer has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. With tomorrow being International Day of People with Disability, how is the Liberal and National government's, Nationals Government continuing to support people with disability in all elements of their lives? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for her question. Well, tomorrow is International Day for, um, of People with Disability, and tomorrow we recognise the contributions and achievements of 4.4 million Australians who live with disability across our nation. And I want to particularly uh, acknowledge the, the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic has had on people with disability and to acknowledge their extraordinary resilience um, of carers, their families and people with disability, the way they came together to support each other through this difficult time. I also would like to acknowledge the frontline disability workers who have demonstrated incredible leadership and courage throughout the pandemic. You know, whether it be someone um, who was taking a person with disability to get that all-important COVID-19 vaccine, whether it was the way people changed how they undertook their care arrangements uh, during lockdown, all people who uh, have been involved in this space, we certainly acknowledge the contribution that you made to help people with disability get through the pandemic. Um, but this government is all about making sure that we also encourage people with disability to meet and encourage them to meet their aspirations by providing opportunity to them and making sure that they are able to access the rewards um, so that they can fulfil their full potential. So tomorrow I will be launching Australia's Disability Strategy 2021 to 2031. It is a commitment of all levels of government, state and territory, local government and the Commonwealth government to make sure that we constantly understand our role in improving the lives of people who live with disability. And this comes on top of more than 3,000 consultations with people with disability, peak bodies, carers, families, uh, academics to make sure that the next national disability strategy, Australia's disability strategy, actually recognises the need to have a foundation to create generational change, a society where all people with disability can reach their potential. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government supporting people with disability into employment? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we know that a job in anybody's life is a game changer, and that should not be any yeah, different yeah, yeah. for somebody who lives with disability. So that's why tomorrow, alongside Australia's disability strategy, I will also be launching the next National Disability Employment Strategy, which is part of our overall strategy to improve the lives of people who live with disability. Um, our employment strategy is aptly named Employ My Ability. And it will be a very much a focus on the abilities of job seekers with disability. My goal is to make sure that we give people with disability access to the full suite of opportunities that every other yeah, Australian yeah. enjoys. We've consulted widely, and can I just acknowledge the Disability Employment Advisory Committee that was chaired by Dylan Alcott and Simon McKeon, who have put in such an extraordinary amount of work to make sure that our next national disability employment strategy meets the needs of job seekers who live with disability. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you. How is the government helping people with disability access support services and up-to-date advice? Minister. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we're committed to ensuring that, that people who live with disability have information about policies, programs and supports that are available to them to yeah, make sure yeah. that they are able to get, uh, have, a, have, have a life of accessibility. And that's why we have invested so strongly in the National Disability Gateway, which assists people, not just people with disability, but their families, their carers and the wider community to have a, a single source of uh, trusted information, advice and referral services. Um, and I'm proud of all the work that we have done uh, to support Australians with disability. Uh, and this year we rolled out the I Can campaign to encourage Australians with disability to make sure that they are accessing the information that we hope will improve their lives. The ad campaign features people who have lived with disability. Uh, they're not actors, they're real people, and it has been a tremendous success. So we will continue to work to make sure that we provide people with disability the same opportunities of, that every Minister, other Australian takes for granted. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Senator Jared Rennick has said of the Pfizer vaccine, and I quote, when are these snake oil salesmen going to be called out? The Pfizer shot doesn't deserve to be called a vaccine. When asked during Senate estimates what action this minister would take in response, he assured, and I quote, I'm happy to follow up personally with my colleague. Has the minister spoke, personally spoken with Senator Rennick about these comments? If so, when and what did he say? The minister representing the Minister for Health Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Sen uh, um, uh, I have Senator Colbeck, you have Thank you, call. Mr. President. I have had conversations with Senator Rick Rennick about the efficacy of vaccines uh, on a number of occasions, Mr. Order. President. Uh, because the data is very, very clear. The vaccines are safe and they work, Mr President. Uh, and so those are the, the, it's, it's those statistics, it's that information uh, that I've put to Senator Rennick, Mr President, because I'm firmly of the belief, I'm firmly of the belief because I look at the information every day, I read the data every day, and the data demonstrates, Mr President, the vaccines are effective. They are effective. Yes, that's exactly right, Senator. I look at the data every day uh, because it's important that we understand that, the, that, that, that that's the case, Mr President. Uh, and it shows in the data, Mr President, in the fact that uh, last year, Mr President, without a vaccine, 7% uh, of cases in this country, Mr President, uh, were in aged care. This year, with the workforce vaccinated and the residents of aged care vaccinated, the number of cases as a proportion of the Senator aged Keneally. care cases is 0.7 per cent, Mr President. Ten times less. Ten times Senator less McAllister. the number of people in aged care as a proportion of cases this year compared to last year, Mr President. So the, the data is very clear. And those are the points that I put to Senator Rennick, Mr President, because I want him to understand what I know by looking at the data. Uh, that the vaccines that we have for oh, Australians ah. are not only safe, uh, but they are effective, Mr. President. Uh, and I will, at every opportunity, continue to repeat that message, not only for people like Senator Rennick, who has some questions, but I'll also repeat that for other Australians to convince all Australians that they ought to take up the opportunity for a vaccine, Mr. President. And over 92 per cent of Australians have now had a first dose. Uh, and approaching 87 per cent have had a second dose. That's a great result, Mr President, and I congratulate Minister, Australians for going out and getting Minister, vaccinated. your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Senator, Senator Rennick has also set up a taxpayer-funded website undermining COVID-19 vaccines, which Australian Medical Association Vice President Chris Moy has described as, and I quote, conspiracy theory push polling. It's about as anti-scientific as you can get. Does the minister agree? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I agree with uh, Mr Moy. Uh, we, we want to ensure that the information that's provided to Australians Order. with respect to, va to vaccines is factual. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and, we, and we as government, uh, and, and particularly as ministers in, in the government, continue, uh, as I said, to look at the data. The, the Therapeutic Goods Administration continues to assess the data on vaccines globally so they can make sure that the appropriate decisions are made. So does the TAGI, Mr President. Uh, they continue to look at the data and the information on vaccines so that they can provide the appropriate advice 
to Australians with respect to uh, achieving vaccine. And Mr. President, I would urge all Australians. I would urge all Australians not to look at what's on Facebook, not to, to look at on what those sorts of sites, but look at the Ataki site, look at the um, TGA site, look at the Department of Health site if they want to get high-quality information about the efficacy of vaccines and the fact that they work in the interest of keeping Australians safe during COVID-19. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, given Senator Rennick has continued to post content on social media which he has admitted may not be 100 per cent right, will the minister publicly condemn Senator Rennick's use of taxpayers' funds to spread vaccine disinformation and conspiracies? Order. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I've urged Senator Rennick to ensure that the information on his website is factual and is true, and, he, and I acknowledge that he's admitted that it isn't. Uh, but, Mr. President, uh, one of the jobs, one of the really important jobs that we all have here in this place, is to give a voice to our constituents. That's one of the things that we do. It's a really important thing we do. But in, in the circumstance of an issue that is so important as this, so important the, as this, it is our responsibility to ensure that the information that, that we are sharing, we are, that the voices that we are giving. Uh, elevation to by the fact, virtue of the fact that we are public figures and have a platform to be able to do that. We need to make sure that that information is true, Mr. President. And I've had that Order. conversation, and I, Mr. President, have had that conversation with Senator Rennick because it's a principle that I believe is extremely important. We want to make sure that Australians get access to information that it's true. We want them to get vaccinated, and we want them to understand the vaccines that we have in this country are safe uh, and that they work. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister provide an update on the number of Australians accessing a home care package and how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting senior Australians? The Minister for Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. And particularly, Mr. President, uh, thank you, Senator, for your interest in improving the lives of senior Australians and their families. Uh, Mr. President, it's been clear over a period of time now that people want more choice. They want to stay connected to their communities. They want to stay uh, in, as independent as possible. They want to remain in their own homes. Mr. President, and our government is delivering on that. The government announced in the budget as part of our response to the Royal Commission a further $6.5 billion uh, as an investment to re release eight. 80,000 additional home care packages. That's 40,000 packages this financial year, Mr. President, and a further 40,000 packages next financial year, Mr. President. That is the single largest investment in home care packages ever. The new data shows that in the three months to the end of September this year, the number of people with access to a home care package grew to over more than 204,000 people, which is an increase of over 41,000 in the last 12 months. Mr President, since the 2018-19 budget, this government has now invested a record $11.9 billion, billion in new funding to deliver an additional 163,000 new home care packages. By June 2023, there will be around 275,000 home care packages available to senior Australians every year. And every year, under our government, home care packages are up, residential places, care places are up, and every year, Mr. President, aged care funding has been up. Mr. President, Labor went to the last election with $387 billion in new tax proposals. Not a single dollar for a home care place, aged care quality and case, uh, care safety or workforce and nothing for age, uh, Minister, mainstream aged care services. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. How is the rollout of home care packages, Minister, expected to further reduce wait lists and wait times? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Mr President, the number of people waiting to receive a home care package continues to decrease, decrease as we work to ensure more Australians can live at home for longer, as more uh, Australians are choosing to do. 
Mr. President, under this government, there has been a significant improvement in the number of people waiting for their home care, approved home care package, with a 25 per cent decrease in the 12 months to September this year. 25 per cent decrease to September this year. Uh, Mr. President, those assessed as a high priority, um, of a high priority need at any level of home care package are now receiving their packages in less than 30 days. Less than 30 days. 99 per cent of senior Australians waiting for a package at their assessed level of need have also been offered support from the government, including an interim package or CHSP, uh, and continue to have access to Australia's world-class health system. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline the design phase of the new home care system? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. In the government's response to the recommendations of the Royal Commission, Mr. President, we announced a commitment to establish a new supported home program. This will replace existing Commonwealth Home Support Program (CHSP) home care packages, short-term restorative care, and residential respite programs. Mr. President, we continue to consult on the critical design of this new program, including elements of improved assessment arrangements that are more consistent more accurate and recognise that not all consumers need in intensive assessments, a modern classification and funding system to ensure support uh, the support senior Australians receive aligns with their assessed care needs, an increased choice of providers across all types and levels of aged care, focus on aged care management in assessment and funding arrangements, better support for informal care, uh, carers and importantly, Mr. President, more support for early interventions to help me, uh, people remain independent and home for longer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When asked about the pace of the vaccine rollout back in March of this year, the Prime Minister said, uh, it's not a race, it's not a competition. Has the Minister asked the Prime Minister why he said that when it wasn't the case. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I think the Prime Minister subsequently said, and the, the Labor Party are very want to go back to, to historical statements and forget about what's happened in, in the intervening period. Mr President, they, Order. Mr, Mr. President uh, but Mr. the Prime Minister also said Order. the Prime Minister also said that it's not it doesn't matter Senator how you start the race it's about a matter of how you finish the race Mr President and Mr President Senator what is quite clear what is quite clear and what is quite inconvenient for the Labor Party what is quite inconvenient for the Labor Party Mr President is that we have one of the best vaccination rates in the world now Mr President uh, in the world Mr President because of the hard Order. work that was done by members of this government, Mr. President, to ensure that we did Order. have vaccine supplies, to do the hard work to ensure vaccine, vaccine supplies came to the country, uh, and we always Senator said Keneally. that the rate of vaccination would increase as the vaccine Order supplies were, right uh, uh, came into the country, and Mr. President, left. and that is exactly what. We, that is exactly what has happened, Mr. President. We said that we would like to be able to offer every Australian vaccine by the end of the year, and we've done that, Mr. President. We've done that in spades. In fact, we've got ample supplies. We are one of the first countries in the world, Mr. President, one of the first countries in the world to have a whole of population booster program underway, Mr. President, and close to half a million Australians have already taken up the opportunity for their booster, Mr. President. So, so, despite the fact that we did have some difficulties with the vaccine rollout at the, out, at the outset, Mr. President, we now have the equal tenth highest first dose vaccination rate in the OECD, Mr. President. Higher than the UK, higher than the US, higher than oh, France, no, higher than Germany, higher than Israel, Mr. President. And so, Mr. Senator President, I think thanks to the Australian people. Thanks to the Australian people, we can say that we have one of the most successful vaccine rollout programs in the world, Mr. President. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. The order. The Prime Minister Senator repeatedly Ciccone has said just, it's not a race after Senator the vaccine. Senator Ciccone, do you want to just restart? I did not hear the start of your question. The Prime Minister repeatedly said it's not a race after the vaccine had been approved by regulators. But when asked why he said the vaccine rollout was not a race, he claimed he only said that in relation to the approval of the vaccines. Has the minister asked the prime minister why he said that when that also was not the case? Minister. 
Well, Mr. President, it's really sad that the Labor Party continue to live in the past when, in fact, we have run one of the most successful vaccination programs in the world, Mr. President. Australians understand that. They understand the importance of the vaccination program. And, Mr. President, they are turning up in their droves, Mr. President, to get vaccinated, Mr. President. And in fact, they're turning up to get their booster shots now that those have become available because we have, have said to the Australian people, and they've come with us, uh, we have good vaccines. Uh, we have a range of supplies of vaccines, uh, and Mr. President. They trust the vaccines overwhelmingly, and they're turning up to get vaccinated. Uh, and, and, and I thank Australians for showing that confidence in our vaccination program and turning up to get vaccinated. Senator Ciccone, a second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, on April 6, the Prime Minister appeared to blame the European Union for a lack of vaccine supplies, which the EU has denied. The very next day, the Prime Minister claimed he never blamed the EU. Has the Minister asked the Prime Minister about his criticisms of the Euro European Union? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, I'm doing what the Prime Minister is, which is looking to the future. Uh, I'm not living in the past, as the Labor Party are doing. We're looking to the future. We're looking, forward, we're looking forward to opening the country up. We're looking forward to the economic recovery that comes along with that, Mr President. And we're looking forward to Australians having the opportunity to travel and be back together for Christmas and into 2022, Mr President. So the Labor Party can live in the past. They can look, in, can look at the future in the Order. rearview mirror, mirror, Mr President. But we, we're getting Order. on with the economic recovery. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how Australia is working with our Pacific family to secure our region's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for International Development, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, and I, I can. Um, our region's health, prosperity and security is absolutely vital to Australia's, and we have been working closely with our partners across the Pacific to address our shared challenges. Now, in, in response to the pandemic, Australia is investing more than $1 billion above and beyond our ongoing development support in our region. And despite some of the messages from those opposite, particularly the Greens, we've already shared over 9.2 million doses across the Indo-Pacific as part of our commitment to deliver 60 million doses to our neighbours by the end of 2022. Yeah. Now, in addition, Australia is investing $130 million in the COVAX facility, which has distributed over 100 million doses to Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and more than 400 million doses globally. Vaccination means more than just doses, and Australia has allocated $623 million to get vaccine doses in arms, including vaccine procurement, distribution, administration, training and planning. Now, beyond the health impacts, this pandemic has also posed serious economic challenges across our region. In 2020-21, Australia provided $361 million in direct financing to support economic growth and social protection in our region. This investment has helped governments in our region to expand social protection schemes to support more than 150 million people. Yeah. Australia is also extending loans worth more than $2 billion to Indonesia and PNG to help address their economic needs, because the economic resilience of these two great democracies is absolutely vital to Australia and to the region. Now, throughout the pandemic, Australia has continued to invest in quality infrastructure through a lending pipeline of more than $1 billion. Already, we've finalised deals to finance renewable energy in the Solomon Islands and undersea telecommunications, cable in Palau and upgrades and maintenance at Fiji's airports. Finally, through our Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme, almost 19,000 workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste are in Australia Minister, and helping to help meet Minister, critical workforce shortages. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question? Thanks, Mr President. Minister, could you uh, update the Senate on how Australia is working with our Pacific partners to ensure stability and security in our region? Minister. Uh, thank you. Australia and our Pacific neighbours share fundamental values, including respect for sovereignty, the rule of law and democratic processes. And all our Pacific family were concerned by recent unrest in the Solomons. As part of our joint efforts with PNG, Fiji and New Zealand, Australia is proudly supporting the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force through a deployment of Australian Federal Police, Australian Defence personnel and diplomats, and we thank them for their work. In my recent visit to Fiji, I saw firsthand the impressive Blackrock Peacekeeping and Humanitarian Assistance Camp that Australia is helping Fiji to redevelop. BlackRock will provide a regional hub 
for peacekeeper training and bolster Fiji's capacity to respond to humanitarian crises and natural disasters. Our defence cooperation program with 12 countries across our region, as well as our $2 billion Pacific Maritime Security Program, is supporting the national security priorities of our Pacific family. This combination of defence cooperation and economic development is helping maintain security and stability Minister, across our region. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. How is Australia backing our partners in the Pacific to support their economic and their development priorities? Minister. Well, while I was in Fiji, I was delighted to launch a new partnership between Australia and Tourism Fiji to help Fijian tourism safely welcome back international visitors. Now, this certification scheme will be delivered by Aspen Medical, a great Canberra company. Now, with tourism representing around 40 per cent of Fiji's GDP and Australian tourists contributing over $50 million a month pre-pandemic, this is a critical sector for Fiji. And yesterday, Fiji celebrated their reopening to international tourists, another important milestone in their economic recovery made possible due to Fiji's world-class rollout using Australian vaccines. Another key Pacific export is Carver, and yesterday I was very pleased to announce phase two of the Morrison government's Carver pilot. Pacific Carver farmers and producers will now have direct access to the Australian market. Carver has enormous potential, enormous cultural and economic importance for the Pacific. The excitement across the Pacific and here in Australia is palpable. The Morrison government is proud to be supporting business-led economic growth yeah. across our region. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. So, thanks, Mr. President and Senator Silger. I'll drink to that. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Just allow a little time for senators to quietly exit the chamber. Pursuant to order, I call on Senator Colbeck to provide an explanation. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, in response to uh, the um, notice passed in the chamber, uh, I advise the chamber that the government maintains its public interest immunity claims advanced in response to the COVID-19 Select Committee's request, Mr. President. Uh, um, Mr. President, can I say I? Thank the Select Committee for its important work this year in overseeing the government's response to the economic and health challenges of the pandemic. The coalition senators acknowledge the important role of parliamentary oversight in our system of government, which has been even more important during the COVID-19 crisis. On both the economic and health fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. Australia's critical response has been underpinned by a combination of extensive testing and contact tracing, high vaccination rates, quarantine of people returning from overseas and measures to control community transmission. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has the second lowest number of COVID cases on a per capita basis. And by avoiding the death rate seen in the OECD, uh, we have saved uh, it's estimated that we've saved over 30,000 lives. Commendably, 87 per cent of the eligible population aged over 16 are fully vaccinated, and hence we are one of the most highly vaccinated societies in the world, with a national booster program already underway. While Australia has been doing it tough, our economy has proved to be resilient. Australia was the first advanced economy to have more people in work than prior to COVID-19. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May 2020. The RBA has recently revised up its forecast for wages and now sees the unemployment rate reaching 4 per cent by the end of 2023. After last year's recession, Australia's economic uh, uh, economy, the GDP, recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world. While Australians have experienced uh, public health restrictions year, this year, uh, the federal government— se Sorry, Senator Colbeck. I think Senator Patrick is on a point of order. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, on relevance, uh, the purpose of this, uh, of this explanation is to, to, to explain why a document hasn't been provided to the Senate, not to rattle off a bunch of stuff about, uh, about uh, uh, performance of government. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. And you can seek to take note of the minister's uh, comments afterwards, if you so choose. Minister, please continue. Thank you, Deputy President. 
While Australians have experienced public health restrictions this year, the federal government has supported 2.19 million individuals who have been paid out of a total of $12.59 billion in COVID-19 disaster payments. Deputy President, in 2021, the committee has held the COVID-19 Select Committee has held 17 public hearings, which includes nine appearances by officials from the Department of Health. This year, the committee has sent out approximately 470 questions on notice to both government and non-government witnesses, and of those, uh, 260 answers have been returned to the committee. Since the com commencement of this inquiry in April 2020, more than 2,000 700 questions to witnesses have been put on notice and more than 2,160 responses to those questions have been received. The committee's public hearings have been held in addition to the regular parliamentary sitting weeks and appearances of government departments and their agencies before Senate estimates hearings. It is clear that parliamentary scrutiny is operating as normally as possible and that parliament is fulfilling its duty to keep government accountable even when challenges have arisen due to, due to public health restrictions across the country. It should be noted, Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, the parliamentary scrutiny of the federal government's response to the pandemic has been far more extensive and robust than any state parliamentary oversight. Given the most onerous restrictions to the liberty of citizens during the pandemic in the name of public health have been imposed by state governments, they should at least have as adequate oversight as the federal parliament has put in place. It is regrettable that in many jurisdictions parliamentary committees have scrut uh, scrutinising the performance of state governments have only been put in place temporarily, have had few public hearings and have often been chaired by government chairs. Um, Senator Colbeck, I am actually going to draw your attention. I have been listening and you did make reference, but there are three orders for um, you to provide an explanation. I've got the document here in front of me of the minister's failure to table the information. And whilst you did start to go some way towards that, you have deviated from that. And that is the requirement of the order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a long standing view of governments bo of both persuasions that the deliberations of Cabinet should remain confidential because disclosure may impact the government's ability to receive confidential information and hence make appropriate and informed decisions for the Australian community. This is especially so, Deputy President, when the responsibility of protecting the health and welfare of the Australian people during a pandemic is at stake. As stated in the second interim report, the relatively few disagreements between this committee and the government regarding a small number of public interest immunity claims should be viewed in light of these facts and the committee's business, uh, busy workload. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the uh, statement from mm -hmm. Minister. Um, and I'm not actually sure that the minister addressed uh, the issues that have been raised in the third interim report by the Select Committee on COVID-19. It seemed to be a whole lot of excuses about the actual fact that scrutiny was occurring um, and continuing to occur. But the real issue here, if we cut to the chase, because it's the final sitting day of the year, and I know there's a lot of other business to get through, is that the Select Committee was established with the support of, of the government and other senators in this place. It was a unanimously uh, agreed to. Uh, the terms of reference were agreed. They were broad. Uh, it was clear that this committee was going to travel um, through the pandemic. And the specific terms of reference are to monitor the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not entirely sure why the states and the Commonwealth's now concern over the lack of scrutiny of the state's role is, is being raised as an issue. It was very clear terms of reference. Yes, we've had a lot of hearings. Yes, we've put questions on notice. And the minister actually made the argument for me pretty well when he said, oh, yeah, and we've answered at least half of them. You know, like That's part of the point, that uh, while the scrutiny process from the, Senate, uh, from the committee side is working, the problem we are having is with the government refusing to either answer the questions or be in very lazy in how they answer them with these by well there's another subset where they actually answer without actually relating that to the question so it's an answer about another matter that wasn't asked 
And then there's this blanket refusal to answer things that they have decided a cabinet in confidence. And they just go, there's this, this I'm sure it goes around the ministerial liaison units of every department because they use the same language. Uh, the government has decided that this information is cabinet in confidence, in line with long-standing conventions, blah, 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 blah. And it's and it, you know, they don't refer often. Departments don't even bother referring it to the minister for a formal claim of public interest immunity. The committee has had to do that, so we get the answer back, and then the committee has to chase them and go back to the department and say, no, that's not how the process works. If you are not going to answer this, then you have to refer it to the minister, and they need to go through the process of making a formal public interest immunity claim, and then you might get it done. But the chasing and the the pushing of government only to have the government reply, well, we've considered it again, and the arguments we made last time, which were uh, not in accordance with the Cormann uh, motion of 2009, uh, remain. And then when we bring it to the Senate and we force it through here, as we did with the second interim report, it's exactly the same thing. So <laughs> we report to the Senate that the government is making that the, the committee has not accepted public interest immunity claims for whatever reason and call for the order of production of documents that the government has ignored the request of the committee. The Senate passes it and then uh, requires the documents to be uh, provided or the minister to come and make a statement. And then the minister, so the documents are never provided, and then the minister comes and makes a statement, which is basically to say, what they said originally to the question on notice. Like it, it is simply not acceptable. It's not how this place should work. It's not how this chamber was set up to work. And the longer this tired old government, eight years in, goes on, the worse it's going to get, because there is seemingly no consequence to this. And the job that the Senate asked us to do and me as chair of the committee and my colleagues, including Senator Patrick, who has attended most of those hearings, which is to scrutinise the response, is impacted because of this government's unwillingness to provide information. And when, I, when people hear what the information is, it is things like the Doherty modelling and presentation that was provided to first ministers. Like, why on earth should the Australian public not have access to that information? AHPPC minutes, when the first lockdowns happened, the advice that was given. Again, why are the Australian public not entitled to that information? I mean, these are important decisions that were taken and information that has been withheld. We've asked for the, I mean, this ridiculous one, the presentation by the Productivity Commission to National Cabinet on the economic recovery, I presume, because we haven't seen it. No, not allowed. And when we've again asked that following Senator Patrick's successful case through the AAT, when we put it back on notice, saying, OK, well, the, uh, Justice White has found that National Cabinet is not a committee of Cabinet and therefore your blanket Cabinet in confidence argument is tossed out, so please provide this document. It comes back, no, not providing it. When you do an FOI, on any, doc, any correspondence that was engaged in about how you came to that decision, you see it's all coming from the Prime Minister's department. Right. All these departments are going, oh, the committee's after those documents again, what do we say? And it's a coordinated refusal to provide that information. Oh, we can't, we, you know, it comes back from PMNC, they've got all their hands on it. Health admitted as much that they had consulted PMNC about their response before refusing again to provide the information to the Senate that was called for by the Senate. And the, the thing is, like, when you are in opposition and you are trying to do this, we will remind you of this, the fact that you are trashing convention and practice of the Senate. You know, so we have to stand up for it. We have to argue for transparency and accountability, and not just what you choose, because it seems to me that the approach the government's taken is we will choose what access Senate committees have to information. And that's not how the system was set up to work. It was that the Senate was the powerful 
It, it had the power to call for documents, to require documents, to order documents if they weren't provided. Not executive government deciding, well, you know what, you can have half of this and a quarter of that and none of that, which is what's happened and which is why the Senate committee has reported for a third time rejecting public interest immunity claims by this government, accepting one. We have accepted one because the argument was made and we accepted that. But on the other ones, access to important information, we haven't accepted it and the Senate yesterday voted to require the government to provide it and we got this. We got a, a, a speech about how great the government's been, how great it's going to be, how great it's always been, but by the way, you're not getting access to anything. It's, it's just not good enough. And um, I, I'll leave some time for Senator Patrick to make some other uh, comments. Uh, but it is impacting on the work that we are able to do, on the job that we have been given by the Senate, and it is an arrogant, out of touch, conceited government that treats the Senate with such disrespect. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Did you wish to make, uh, take note of the same matter? Thank so you, I do, and I will, uh, but I still also reserve yes. uh, my rights in respect of uh, 74 yes, of uh, uh, 5. Um, just in relation to uh, this, this particular matter, I want to sort of touch on uh, perhaps three areas. The first of those is just the disrespect of the executive, uh, and I'm talking about ministers, in uh, making claims, making claims which uh, now I might point out is not just uh, in, in uh, defiance of Justice White's decision that National Cabinet is not a Cabinet, but now also in defiance of a Senate resolution that says that particular public interest immunity in relation to National Cabinet is not to be advanced. Is not to be advanced. That is what the Senate has decided, and as officers of the Senate, uh, indeed, uh, people need to look very long and hard at themselves in advancing those sorts of immunities. Look, I'll give you another one to try intergovernmental relations, because that may uh, actually constitute a reasonable uh, uh, public interest immunity. But stop lying. Stop uh, de deliberately misleading. Stop uh, basically uh, confronting uh, what is law in Australia. Accept the law as it is and that National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. The second point I would uh, uh, touch on, and that this goes to what um, this goes to what uh, uh, Senator Gallagher was was talking about, and that is, you know, public officials turning up and uh, basically making public interest to community uh, immunity claims as well. Not also knowing full well, because it's been quite highly publicised the matter in the AAT against the Prime Minister by myself where Justice White established that there was a, a, um, a uh, uh, that the National Cabinet was not a Cabinet. And I'll just go back to the law as it is in Australia. Okay? I'm not, this is not me suggesting uh, what should happen. This is the law. Under the Public Service Act, um, uh, uh, under Section 10, there are certain values that the APS holds that include uh, that they act uh, with, uh, in a professional manner, in an objective manner. They act with integrity. And indeed, uh, uh, section uh, 10 in brackets 5, the APS is, an, is apolitical and provides advice that is frank, honest, timely and based on the best available evidence. That is the obligation placed in law upon public servants. And what, what's happening here, and I've named a few of them, uh, and I might point out there's another one that's, uh, that I've just got back uh, in the last uh, day, day or so from another public servant. I'll come, come back to that when I deal with, uh, uh, with uh, late questions on notice. But in effect what happens here is the secrecy uh, obsession of the Prime Minister drives down through the front bench, who don't have the courage to stand up and say, uh, sorry Prime Minister, I'm going to recognise principles uh, in respect of the rule of law and I'm not going to say to the Senate what you want me to say, which is that National Cabinet is in fact a Cabinet, when we know that it is not and the Senate has resolved that it is not. So that's the first problem. 
We've got uh, ministers not standing up to the Prime Minister, perhaps more worried about their own uh, position, their own personal uh, position and perhaps the money that flows from that, rather than their obligation to the public. And what happens is they push this down uh, through, the, the, through the public service where, in effect, they, they force public servants to breach the law, to act in a manner that is inconsistent with the APS uh, values and the APS code of conduct, also enshrined in the Public Service Act. Now, I'm not actually making any excuses for those public servants because they, particularly the senior ones, ought to stand up and say, sorry, Minister, I'm not saying that. I'm not doing that. And sadly, we've seen some examples, led by Mr Gaitchens, uh, as to where they just cast that aside and say, no, I'm going to hoist my, I'm going to hoist my, my, uh, my Liberal Party spinnaker because whilst uh, the, the Liberal government is in, in charge, I'm going to do everything that they say. That's what Mr Gaitchens does. Okay? And then, uh, you know, and I, I'm hoping that the, Liberal, the Labor Party, should it get into government, looks very long and hard at some of these people and looks at their moral fortitude, looks at their courage. And again, I'm not talking about some very good people that work in the APS do a really good job. I'm talking about the very senior people that are uh, corroding what, uh, what would otherwise be you know, the confidence that we're supposed to have in the public service. So that's the second problem. The third problem is actually our problem. It's the problem of the Senate, who simply allows this to happen. And I'm going to go to the, the, again to the report of the Privileges Committee uh, in the last uh, few days, where we had a lawful order of the Senate, a lawful order of the Senate, not complied with by a statutory officer. And in actual fact, somehow the Privilege, Privileges Committee finds that that's not a contempt. It's no wonder there's only half the questions getting answered in this place. Now, I'll go to the matter, and, and I know uh, Senator O'Neill uh, raised this yesterday, but I'm not convinced, and that is the referral that took place in relation to the lack of provision of documents to uh, the Economics Committee, the referral made on the 15th of June this year. Six months later, we're, just, you know, we're likely to end this parliament without that matter being resolved. Now, I'm happy to inform the chamber that there at least has been some agreement in respect of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the provision of information to the Economics Committee, and that's a good thing, but it's taken six months. It's taken six months. And nothing, nothing that happens from now will undo the fact that the minister and the secretary has frustrated this, uh, this Senate from being able to conduct its, its uh, job. Uh, we'll, um, I'm absolutely sure we'll get to a point now where that committee will not report properly. Sadly, we've lost the chair, who had so much passion in relation uh, to this particular issue. Um, but the Senate will, may, not, may not end up reporting on this, certainly not doing the job that it wanted to do. And whose fault is that? It's the fault of the Senate. Uh, I'm sorry, but the, the fact that the Privileges Committee has taken six months to get to this point is atrocious. I invite the chair um, uh, of the Privileges Committee and Senator, Senator Abetz, uh, as the, as the uh, deputy chair, both senators who I respect gratefully, very, very tough senators, in normal circumstances. I don't understand what's happening here. I invite them to go and read uh, Machiavelli's The Prince. That will show you how um, you can deal with these sorts of circumstances. Just a couple of fines, just a couple of jail uh, terms would stop this instantly. We wouldn't be having these debates. We wouldn't be having these discussions. But unfortunately, as I've found out, the, the Privileges Committee is weak. The Privileges Committee of the Senate is weak. If any journalist ever uses the word the powerful Privileges Committee, I'm going to correct them. Okay? <clears throat> this is the fault of the Senate. It is the, no, it's not the fault of the government. The government, are, the government are in breach. The government are in breach, but we do nothing about it. It's within our power to do something about it, and we don't. Order. We don't Order. do anything about it. <coughs> And that's the problem. I mean, it's, 
Senator O'Neill is welcome to stand up after and, and, and uh, take note as well. But here's, this is the problem. And we don't, we don't get to go and look to somebody else and say, hey, guys, it's not fair, they're not playing the game. We're at the top of the tree. We, we sit at the top. It's up to us to do it. It's us to, up to us to stand firm. The powers are there. They flow through from section 49 of the Constitution. There is no question. We know the House put a couple of uh, journalists, and that was, uh, in my view, was wrong, but put a couple of journalists into the Goulburn jail for a little while. Okay? The power exists. The High Court affirmed that. The High Court affirmed that power. Just as the High, uh, just as the, um, high Court in Egan and, and, and Willis affirmed the powers for us to produce documents, just as uh, in Egan and Chadwick, uh, the, the New South Wales Court of Appeal uh, affirmed the ability to uh, receive uh, documents that were legally privileged. But it is up to us. I'm not saying the government's doing the right thing, and I'm not saying the public servants, the senior public servants, are doing the right thing. They're in fact breaking the law, but we're not doing anything about it, and that needs to change. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe that's carried. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, Madam uh, Deputy President, I, I um, uh, pursuant to a, a section, uh, Standing Order 74.5, I seek an explanation from uh, the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why, and this is the third time I've asked in this sitting fortnight, um, that uh, question number 3985 has not been answered by the, the, the Department of PMC. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. I thank Senator Patrick uh, for his, uh, his question. Um, uh, the processes around finalising uh, those answers have not been able to be finalised uh, at this, uh, this point in time. Uh, it has been a, uh, a very busy period for all involved, as I've indicated to the Senate before. Uh, through the life of this parliament, uh, there have been uh, record numbers uh, of questions asked across questions on notice to the Senate chamber, across parliamentary estimates, uh, uh, proceedings. Uh, indeed, uh, I think the questions uh, total something close to, um, uh, to uh, that experienced in the previous two parliaments combined. Uh, the government's worked hard to try to provide answers uh, and has delivered answers to record numbers of questions. Uh, I apologise to Senator Patrick in relation to this one that, uh, that I don't have a further update for him. Senator Patrick. Take note of the minister's answer. Uh, again, uh, this, uh, this question relates to uh, a request, a simple request as to how much money was spent in my case against the Prime Minister in relation to National Cabinet. Because you know what? I'm interested in finding out the answer. I'd love to know why whatever money, amount of money was spent, we spent that money when the government was just going to not, uh, not comply with uh, the, the, the principles that uh, Justice White has put. And the second one goes to the cost of uh, looking at a Section 37 uh, certificate uh, to censor the Auditor General, uh, an Auditor General's report um, that was issued by uh, Attorney General Porter. Again, an AAT matter where the AAT overturned uh, the Attorney General's um, uh, censoring. Uh, all I've asked for is how much did the proceedings cost? That's an accounting system question. And it's not like I stand up here every question after every question time and, and surprise the minister. I actually do the right thing in accordance with the president's guidance in, re in relation to the standing order. I contact the relevant minister's office and I advise them that a particular question hasn't been answered and that I may choose to exercise my rights under the standing orders. It's not like I, uh, that uh, somehow I surprise the minister in, in doing this. And so all I can, all I can think, you know, I go back to last week and uh, uh, Senator Birmingham stood up and said, look, um, I think it might have been Senator Dunningham on, behalf, on, on his behalf, stand up and said, look, uh, we're trying to get to this answer. But after the second time I asked the question, and now the third time I seek an explanation, I would have thought that 
the minister would have picked up the phone to the Prime Minister and said, you know what, can we just give Senator Patrick his answer? But no, that's too hard. Again, this question goes to costs around the proceedings in the AAT in relation to National Cabinet. And it, and it, does, it does disturb me um, because, firstly, I don't think... Uh, uh, on, on the evidence that was supplied uh, to, the, to the tribunal by Geoffrey Watson SC, eminent barrister, and I thank him for his pro bono work on the issue, uh, it would have been obvious to anybody that uh, there was no argument to be had, that National Cabinet did not meet any of the requirements of a Cabinet, didn't have Cabinet solidarity, didn't have didn't have, didn't have cabinet responsibility, wasn't even formed by the federal cabinet. It wasn't a committee of the cabinet because it was, it was uh, proposed uh, by COAG. It was a committee of the COAG. And uh, uh, all of these things, you know, the fact that a cabinet consists of uh, members of parliament and uh, members of parliament or was responsible to one parliament, not to nine, as is the case with the, with the National Cabinet. You know, the, the, the Prime Minister had said, in his own words, he said, you know, we have these Cabinet meetings and, and uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes some Premiers disagree. But, but the bus leaves the bus station and you either get on or you don't. That's not allowed in a Cabinet system. In a Cabinet system, the principle is you go in, you have your argument, but when you come out, everyone sings off the same hymn sheet, such that there is a, a, a confidence in, uh, in those decisions of Cabinet. And uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's clear, it was clear going into those proceedings that there was no chance that, uh, that Justice White would find in any other way than that, 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 there wasn't a, um, that it wasn't a, a committee of the Cabinet. And yet, today, sadly, in the last couple of days, I've got yet another FOI decision that's come back. Another FOI decision. Not, not after Cabinet minutes this time. After um, the, I, I seek access to the following information relating to the Infrastructure and Transport National Cabinet Reform Committee established in October 2020. I want the minutes of all meetings and the action items for all meetings. So I'm not after, uh, in this instance, even the meetings of the, the, of the National Cabinet. I'm after some peripheral committee that they've established that might feed in and provide advice. If you look at where National Cabinet uh, extends to, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's almost, you know, it could, it, it, half of the, 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 the government could well be covered by a national cabinet claim if it were permitted under law, which it is not. But again, I've got a, an official here, uh, in this case Petra uh, Gartman, and I am going to continue to name people. I, I point out I've had over, 20, uh, to, to over 200 FOIs and I've never come into this chamber and named uh, uh, a decision maker. I normally simply appeal them. That's the normal process, but in this instance, it's so offensive that the claims, uh, in respect of the claims that are being made, against such a prominent and weighty judgment from Justice White. Um, uh, I, I get an answer that says, acknowledges, I'm aware of and have considered the Administrative Appeals Tribunal decision delivered on the 5th of August 2021 by Deputy President Justice. White in Patrick and the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet 2021, AAT, uh, AAT uh, 2719. Then goes on to say that in addition to the, uh, to the decision in Patrick, I have considered the National Cabinet's terms of reference of the 15th of March 2020, made public after the, the decision in Pat Patrick, and a joint statement by, made on the 17th of September by the Prime Minister, State Premiers and Territory Ch uh, Chief Ministers on the importance of confidentiality to relationships between the Commonwealth and states and territories. I have formed the view that National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act. Above and beyond the law. Above, that's, a, that's an official. Well, it is, it is a, 
I'm, I'm accepting out. those. I'm accepting those interjections. It is, in fact, a mandate driven down from the very, very top, from a prime minister who says, "I am addicted to secrecy, and the Australian public will not find out what it is that we're up to." And uh, it flows down through Mr Gachins and now down to the next level, where sadly those officials are acting in, in breach of the law. It's not that they're, you know, they're making a, a, an FOI decision uh, that, that's wrong. I mean, that's not, not punishable. Okay? It's appealable but not punishable. But they are breaking uh, the law in that they breach the APS uh, core values and the code of conduct, which requires for that objectivity, that it requires, requires professionalism, requires fearless and frank advice. And in the case of independent decision makers, it requires the decision maker to consider all of the facts, uh, consider the law and to make a, deter a determination. Now, I've got three of these decisions and I've seen one from another constituent that use a template format. That tells me that the department is not taking the, the issue uh, seriously in terms of their uh, approach to freedom of information. They're doing what Mr Morrison tells them. They're supposed to independently, each one of them, look at the matter, look at the cases, not look at the hymn sheet produced by Mr Morrison. And it brings them into disrepute, sadly brings them into disre disrepute. The way this works, and, and I, just, I would go back to, just to make it very clear to the chamber, what these officials are saying is, is that there's new information that Justice White didn't consider, and they then mention some terms of reference. Except if they read the decision of Justice White, I think it's para 189, uh, I, may be, uh, I may, be, may be mistaken there, but if you read the decision, Justice White read the terms of reference and read the terms of reference in the context that the decision maker was concerned about, saying that, that uh, uh, these are the terms of reference established by COAG. They were actually part of the FOI documents that were provided to me. And Justice White saw them, he looked at them, and then when he was making his decision, he, made some, he made, raised some serious concerns about PM&C, which is supposed to be the preeminent uh, a government body, he raised concerns that they hadn't put on any evidence other than secondary, other than hearsay, uh, as to the forming up of the National Cabinet. So he said, you know what, I'm going to take the terms of reference that were in the documents and I'm, going to, I'm actually going to include them in my decision. Because, and then he said, but it doesn't change the fact, because the terms of reference were generated by COAG. So that's the first point that these decision makers are, are trying to hang their hat on. And it's wrong. It's simply wrong. The second one is they say that since that decision, the Prime Minister and the Premiers all stood up and said, we want National Cabinet to be confidential. Except that's not how, the way, how this works. Justice White was asked to, to, to make a legal determination on the statutory expression of Committee of Cabinet. Okay? What, he was asked to interpret what was in the statutes. No amount of statements outside of this chamber as to what, is, uh, what Committee of uh, Cabinet means, whether it's the Prime Minister, Premiers or even a, a, a legal expert, can override what Justice White has said. If the Department and the Prime Minister thought that, he, that Justice White was wrong, they could have appealed it to the full bench of the federal court. And they didn't. They didn't. And so what do they go off and do now? They now just come out with this, this approach that says, let's just ignore what the judge said. And that's why I stand up in this chamber upset. That's why I'm having a go at uh, public servants directly, noting their seniority and their, the, 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 the need for them to respect the law of this land. That's why I stand up and say what I do, and I'm doing it on a regular basis, because it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to the Australian public. I mean, just the principle in general. 
that, uh, that Australians are not allowed to see some of the really important in, uh, decisions that were made by the National Cabinet that affected their liberties. We weren't allowed to see the AHPPC's advice as to whether children should go to school or whether we should have lockdowns or what constituted a hotspot. All of that sort of stuff ought to have been made available to the public. It should have been made available to the public and the, and the, the, the Prime Minister should have recognised that the release of that information was important. It was important for, the, the, for public confidence. But he failed to do so. He failed to recognise that. Um, so, um, that's why I'm, I'm disturbed about what's happening here. We've got another official who simply has not had regard to, to her obligations, Petra Gartman, again, uh, uh, basically trimming her sails to the political will of the Prime Minister. And you know, it is quite appropriate for me to walk in here uh, noting that uh, the government spent money. They spent money on a QC uh, to challenge uh, me in the AAT. They spent all that money. I want to know how much it is. And the minister, Prime Minister, is refusing to provide me with that information. And that's why I come in here week after week and day after day, and I'll continue to do so uh, in the very few sitting weeks that we have uh, next, next year, to press for this answer. Gee, I hope by February I've got an answer to this question. It's just, just, the government needs to understand our role is oversight. Our role is to inquire, to inform ourselves as to what government is doing on behalf of the people and to question what they're doing on behalf of the people. And that's exactly what we, 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 we do when we ask a question on notice. We're not doing it for ourselves, we do it for our constituents, the people who we represent and the people who actually pay the minister's salaries and the public servant's salaries. And it's completely disrespectful that you take, that the, the government takes uh, uh, you know, more than the, the, the 30 days in the standing orders to answer these questions. Uh, I hope uh, the next time I stand uh, I will not be uh, needing to exercise uh, Standing Order 74.5. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to take note of answers to questions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move on to taking notes. Senator O'Neill. Very much, Deputy President, and I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham and Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher, uh, Senators at uh, Senator Ayres and Senator Ciccone. Uh, and before I go to my prepared remarks, can I just indicate that we would normally be finished this part of the day, but we've had 45 minutes of hearing about what it's like in this building, the stench of a place. It's like swimming in a sewer. And the king of the sewer rats is Mr Morrison, leading them along a path of deception. What a way to end the year. What a way to close out this year. Another year of scandals. Another year of jobs for the mates. Press releases with no policy. Rorts, botched vaccine rollouts, backflips and lies after lies. And they delivered the same performance again at question time. The government of Liberal and National members and senators had two major jobs this year. They needed to establish proper quarantine and they needed to roll out the vaccine. They still have not established proper quarantine and people are facing Christmas going, are we going to be okay? And they're worried because the government hasn't done its job and they should be worried because this government has not done its job and it does not deserve to be re-elected. They had to roll out a vaccine. Instead, we got a stroll out and, oops, I forgot to order. That's the quality of the government. They need to be kicked out. Even the cabinet have just been as hapless. The government have had an NDS, NDIS minister constantly undermine the scheme. Call it welfare for life. That's what they call it. The government have had an industry minister at war with this Australia's car industry and allegedly with her own staff. The government has a communication minister more interested in attacking online 
critics of the government than building the NBN, the fix of the whole piece of infrastructure that they totally stuffed up across the country. And of course, we haven't seen any legislation to establish a Federal Integrity Commission. And you can see why, in their answers to questions today, the debate that has ensued since question time finished and this litany of failures of a corrupt and incompetent government. It's been a significant year for the Liberals and National Party to hide their dirty deeds behind public interest immunity claims, hiding the dirty deals that they do, saying it's not in the public interest to put it out for, for critique for the Senate to overlook it. They've blacked out FOI requests. They've constantly rorted government funds, using taxpayers' dollars as their own personal re-election fund. When it comes to accountability, it's only ever silent night for those opposite. In these historic times, the government's fallen far short of the ambition that the moment requires. This is a listless, drifting government. It has no integrity and no vision. It's a government that's been characterised throughout all of 2021 and the years that preceded it, the long seven years before we've had to watch this shameless display. It's completely, completely and totally let down the women of Australia. Mr Morrison and his cabinet, his cabinet have fallen short of even my ever diminishing expectations of what they might be able to do. When it comes to the treatment of women in this place and outside, they have abjectly failed 50 per cent of the population. They do not deserve another term. They deserve to be kicked out. Mr Morrison's failure to meet the moment, his pettifogging, his refusal to hold his own ministers accountable are a shame on this entire place. And I only hope that the women of Australia remember how those opposite, the Liberal and National Party members here, have let them down at every opportunity. Here are the 12 days of Scott Morrison's Christmas for the Australian people. 12 jobs for his mates, 11 months of policy and action, 10 days of sitting until next August, nine glossy blue brochures, eight sitting days of chaos, seven vaccine targets missed, six car parks cancelled, five backflips at least, four ministerial resignations, three fewer senators to count on in this chamber, too many lies, one big botched rollout. Australia, that's your Christmas present from Mr Morrison. He's no Santa. Instead of good governance, we've had zero integrity commissions, zero women's budget statements, zero action on housing affordability and zero accountability from those opposite. It's been a year of power without glory. Do not give them the chance to continue next you, year in Senator the same Neil, way. Your time has expired, Senator Askew. Well, Madam Deputy President, once again we've had a series of misquotes, vague references and accusations against the Prime Minister from the opposition in our question time today. What a way to finish the last week of another very difficult year. Surely there were questions of policy that they could have asked, but no, only innuendos and wild accusations, including around quarantine proposals loaded with implications. Quarantine Services Australia is a not-for-profit company established by the private sector to support industry. And it's important to note that the government has not and is not funding QSA in any way. Of course, we do have an interest in the work they, they do, or they're proposed to do, because we want Australian businesses to be able to bring in the skilled workers they require to grow and create more jobs during our pandemic recovery. We know there's a skilled workforce shortage in Australia and travel restrictions during the pandemic have presented particular challenges. That's why we've flagged skilled workers are our next stage in the border reopening, which, as we know, was due this week, but has been paused until the 15th to give us time to understand the new Omicron variant. That said, our vaccination rates being among the highest in the world means we're now in a very strong position. That's why the New South Wales, ACT and Victorian governments removed the requirement to quarantine for fully vaccinated international travellers from the 1st of November. And in my home state, Tasmania, it's due, we're due to follow on the 15th of December. 
Dependent on vaccination rates, the remaining states and territories have flagged their intention to remove the requirement for fully vaccinated international travellers to quarantine by the end of this year or early next year. So the large scale quarantine services we thought back in July that may be necessary are unlikely to be required in the future due to what we've achieved with our vaccination program. However, we do know that quarantine arrangements will likely continue to be necessary for certain groups of people coming into the country. So the formation of Quarantine Services Australia is a positive thing, an industry-led solution to help industry bring in the workforce they require. The Department of Home Affairs engaged DPG to facilitate a model capable of developing a quarantine approach that was private sector funded, scalable and acceptable to the states and territories. The model was required to be operational in the absence of any federal government financial support. And on the topic of quarantine facilities, I remind senators that during the course of COVID-19, this government has successfully worked in partnership with the Northern Tasmanian government to utilise the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs and indeed doubled its bed capacity, expanding the facility's capability to 2,000 beds. We're also looking at Victoria's Mickleham facility, which has 100 bed capacity, and the first stage should be complete shortly. We've also been working with the Western Australian Government on a new centre for national resilience, and we're in talks with the Queensland Government for a federal quarantine facility there too. These new centres for national resilience, which are fully funded by the Commonwealth, will increase capacity to repatriate Australians. However, afterwards, these facilities will also be available for other important long-term resilient, use, resilient uses, such as supporting responses to natural disasters. Madam Deputy President, today is our final day in this place for 2021, and later today we'll be undertaking a time of reflection and thanks for the year we have had. We will be wishing those around us a great break, a lovely holiday and a joyous Christmas season. So with that in mind, Madam Deputy President, how can we justify the behaviour we've seen in this place, not just today where those opposite have once again launched an attack on the Prime Minister, but over recent days where unparliamentary behaviour and comments have been made against each other? The Jenkins report was entitled Set the Standard, and that is something that each and every one of us in the building, and particularly this place, should reflect on, particularly over the coming weeks. Too often there is language used, there are remarks made with the sole purpose of inflicting pain, and blatant disrespect is evident. We should be attacking the policies of our opponents, not the person. Madam Deputy President, I hold the Institute of the Senate and other senators in high regard and believe that when we return in 2022, we must hold each other to even greater account. This is not a gender or sexuality issue. It's not a political or a race issue. We are all here as equals. And we need to show due respect to that fact and to each other. I look forward to seeing everybody in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, here we are at the end of Parliament for the year, and after eight years in government, three years under Prime Minister Morrison, what are we left with? A government in shambles, a government that is divided, a government that is coming apart at the seams, a government who can't keep their own people in line, a government who can't pass their own legislation, a government that Australians simply can't trust, a government that is led by a Prime Minister who can't seem to determine what is fact and what is fiction, a Prime Minister who says one thing one day and something completely different the next. From Cabago to Paris, our Prime Minister he is known for being loose with the truth. That is his reputation. Uh, and this is a government and a prime minister the people of Australia cannot trust to deliver for them. Because with Prime Minister Morrison, every problem is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. And instead of action, what we get from this prime minister is excuses. It's not my job. It's a matter for the states. I don't hold a hose. 
Whether it's bushfires or whether it's a global pandemic, Australians just can't trust this Prime Minister to lead. Australians couldn't trust him to roll out the vaccines. They couldn't even trust him to buy the vaccines in the first place. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister, the Prime Minister who said we were at the front of the queue and then said it wasn't a race, a Prime Minister who said one thing one day and something the next, and Australians paid the price this year. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister to lead this country in a crisis, and they cannot trust this Prime Minister to lead the country at all. Australians can't even trust the Prime Minister to run his own government or even to run his own party. This Prime Minister is distracted by division in his own ranks. We have members of parliament, senators crossing the floor, left, right. We are uh, in a situation in this place today where the government is held hostage by one nation, held hostage by the extremes of its own party room. We are in a situation today where we have a prime minister who is showing no leadership whatsoever to rein in the members of his own party, his own government, who are spreading fear and misinformation about vaccines. He can't even shut down the misinformation of Senator Rennick. This Prime Minister cannot keep his own party in line. So how can the people of Australia expect him to deliver for them? This is a Prime Minister who won't rein people in who are spreading misinformation and mistruth, even when their actions threaten to undermine the advice of the public health experts, even when they threaten the efforts of the millions of Australians who have gone out and done the right thing and got themselves vaccinated, even when they put the health of Australians at risk. It is completely unacceptable and shameful. But instead of providing leadership when we need it, instead of building on the values that saw us come together over the course of this pandemic, we have a Prime Minister seemingly happy to benefit, to benefit from the division in our community, playing a dangerous game of double speak in a desperate scrounge for votes, a desperate ploy to distract the people of Australia from the fact that after eight years, they don't have a plan for the things that matter to Australians. They have no plan to deliver the things that matter. A plan for good, secure jobs, the jobs that people need. They've got no plan to grow wages, the flattest on record. They've got no plan to fix our broken aged care system and value our aged care workers. No plan to rebuild manufacturing and make more of what we need here. No plan to act on climate and bring green energy jobs to Australia. And at a time when wages are going backwards and the cost of everything is going up, they've got no plan to make people's lives any better. No plan to make it easier. No plan to build a better and brighter future. This government can't even imagine that future, let alone deliver it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Walsh, and I call Senator Hughes. Deputy President, well, all I can say, honestly, is wow. Like, seriously. Sen I Senator thought... Hughes, just hold for a moment. I don't believe your microphone is on. Mm. I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I'll come back to the beginning and I just want to say, guys, wow. I really did think there might have been some people on the opposite side of this chamber with a little bit of EQ, a little bit of emotional intelligence, might have been able to read the room. We had an incident in this chamber last night that was absolutely disgusting. The most vile of comments was made by a Green senator towards me that has been widely reported as one of the most vile things that has ever been said in this chamber. So what are you coming here today with? What are you coming here with? Smears, personal attacks, misinformation, lies. It is absolutely pathetic. Is that all you have? I mean, we know Albo's running a small target strategy. He's beyond small Order. target. He's not Order. there. Senator Hughes. Apologies. Uh, please refer to members of the other place by their correct title or full name. Apologies. Senator Hughes. The member for Graindler. No, he's running a small target strategy. But there's 
no such thing as a no-target strategy which he's trying to achieve. I mean, there are, you have no policies on anything, and that is reflected in the fact that you come in here day after day making personal smears against the Prime Minister that are based in absolute mistruth, misinformation, distorting the facts. And I'm going to come back to COVID a little bit later. But listening to some of the responses and the comments that are coming from the opposite side of the chamber, I'm not sure we live in the same country. Australia has the highest vaccination rates amongst most countries across the world. We are at such a significant rate of vaccination, and this might be one for you to take a little note of. That's why we don't need quarantine centres, because once we're vaccinated, we're not quarantining. So we understand that you guys like to just throw money around, like, you know, because it's the taxpayers and you just chuck it where you can. There is no need for them. You guys wanted to give people 300 bucks to get the vaccine. They've gone out and got it willingly for nothing. Six billion dollars you were prepared to just up the wall. Six billion dollars of taxpayers' money to try and pay people to get a vaccine. Did not need to, do, to, to even think about it. But I would actually just like to point out to this place that not only in this chamber do we hear vile comments, but in question time today in the other place, when the uh, Minister Hunt was answering a question for the member for Chisholm, an ALP, ALP member screamed across the chamber, go and get a room. Well, we know you can't read it. Someone screamed out, go and get a room to Minister Hunt when he was answering a question from Gladys Liu. Seriously, has it, have you been sleepwalking through this week? The Jenkins report has been released on a week where we have seen the behaviour in this place to descend to new levels. Now, I haven't heard from one member of the Greens, and I'd like to say if Richard needed, Senator Di Natale and Senator see what were here, they were absolutely decent people, and I have no idea the leader of the Greens when it was Senator Di Natale would have come and spoken to me about the vile behaviour of his colleague. He would have come and talked to me, he would have come and seen me. Rachel Seawood, I can guarantee, would have done that and messaged me after the many years I've spent with her on committees and knowing what a decent person she is. But not a word, not a peep from someone at the end of this chamber. Absolutely shameful behaviour. The words are, I apologise for my colleague's conduct. But on top of that, just to rub a little extra salt in the wound, this morning, the member for Sydney, who ironically is my local member, when was asked a question about the vile comment directed at me, started her sentence with, if it's true. If it's true. So we believe her, believe all women, oh, 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 except for conservative women, they deserve it. They should have got it. It's fine to speak to conservative women in that way because we're treated differently by women of the left. So it's not just what was said in this chamber, but the reaction that has been demonstrated by the highest profile woman in the ALP responding with, if it's true. Well, it was true. There was an apology given because it was so true. And you, all you women in the Labor Party should be ringing up the member for Sydney and asking her to apologise, because that is disgusting and disgraceful. And if you've got nothing but personal smears against the Prime Minister going into this election, do you honestly think Australians who've had their jobs saved, who have incredibly high vaccinations rate, who have been supported through this pandemic is such a good way that you think your smears are going to have any impact on the result? Thank you, Senator Hughes. I call Senator Grogan. Thank you. Australians were truly disgusted to see the Prime Minister's behaviour last year, and that is not a smear. That is a fact. This is not a grubby attack, as accused by those on the other side. It's a fact. Mr Morrison was off on holiday in Hawaii when the bushfires hit, and when he finally got back, finally decided he should maybe do something, he made the whole thing about himself. One of the things that shocked people about Mr Morrison's behaviour was his conduct towards Zoe, the young woman that Senator Ayres was talking about just before. And he referred questions to Minister Birmingham about that exchange. She's a young woman, young pregnant woman at the time, who had lost her home. And the Prime Minister grabbed her hand to shake it. That's a fact. Patted her on the shoulder. That's also a fact. 
And when she turned around to plead with him for help, he walked away. That is also a fact. They're not smears. They are facts. Senator Birmingham implied that Senator Ayres was out of line when he brought up this exchange. And that is outrageous. Those opposite said it was grubby that we would raise such things. It's not grubby. These are facts we're addressing here. Zoe, in her own words, said, I have lost everything. My house is burnt to the ground and the Prime Minister had turned his back on me. That is outrageous to say that those things are slurs. They are not. They are facts. In my home state, South Australia, was hit especially hard by the bushfires last year. The bushfires that Mr Morrison handled so atrociously. Again, that is a fact. Kangaroo Island, Cuddly Creek, communities across the Adelaide Hills, homes and businesses were lost. Livelihoods were ruined and lives were lost. Mr Birmingham has accused us of muckraking for raising it. It's not muckraking. The courage, strength and commitment shown by people across Australia has not been matched by their Prime Minister. He showed his, two, his true character in the heat of that crisis and he let us all down. The bushfire season started yesterday in South Australia and we're worried. We are worried about a repeat of last year and we are worried that once again we'll be abandoned by this government. Mr Birmingham says we should all be talking about policy, not people. That we shouldn't be raising these points, we should be just talking about policy. Okay, so let's talk about the Emergency Response Fund. The government has spent just 0.37% from a $4.7 billion fund, an emergency response fund. Now, you'd imagine from the name that it is about responding, responding to emergencies. But two and a half years after it was established, a minute amount of money has been allocated. So let's talk about the fact that this fund can allocate up to $200 million a year for disaster recovery and resilience. Things such as constructing evacuation centres, fire breaks and other mitigation measures that this country desperately needs. But by failing to invest this $4.7 billion fund, this government has again failed Australians. And this Prime Minister has again failed Australians especially those who live in the bush. The Prime Minister has ignored very clear warnings by former New South Wales fire rescue um, head, Greg Mullins, and 23 other fire and emergency chiefs back before the 2019-2020 fire season. He refused to invest in a national aerial fire firefighting fleet. Again, that is a fact. And when Australia was on fire, he went on holiday to Hawaii, fact, and posed for gratuitous selfies on the beach. What we need is real action. We need properly resourced fire surfaces. We need help for our communities to prepare for future fire, um, for bushfire risks. And we need a prime minister and a government that acts and listens. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And the question is that the motion moved by Senator O'Neill that the Senate take note of questions by Senators Ayres, Gallagher and Ciccone of Minister Birmingham and Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the responses of Minister Rustin to the questions asked by my colleague, Senator Cox. Um, it is Australia's shame that the Liberals are propping up coal, oil and gas by funneling endless taxpayer dollars to these dirty industries. The world is moving away from digging up fossil fuels, but the Liberals are pouring tens of millions of dollars of public money to frack the Beetaloo Basin and plunge us further into the climate crisis. 
The liberals live in some parallel universe where there are no consequences for mining and burning fossil fuels. Or you have your heads buried in the sand because it fills the coffers of those who line your pockets with cash. Or you just don't care because you have the luxury of being able to afford to protect yourselves from the deadly consequences that marginalized communities will have to face. The Pacific, uh, Pacific Islanders don't have the luxury as their homelands sink underwater. The people on the subcontinent where I come from don't have that luxury as thousands die every year due to brutal climate-induced heat waves. First Nations people don't have the luxury as you destroy their land and water. Traditional owners do not consent to fracking on their land. Beetaloo Basin's traditional owners have already condemned the Morrison government for ha handing out millions to gas companies. Tax dodging companies, big donors, and billionaires will profit from the destruction of First Nations lands. All this while local communities are struggling for basic infrastructure like health and housing. And what for? For the profits of climate wrecking corporations. 70% of the Northern Territory land is earmarked for fracking. If the Beetaloo Basin is opened up and fracked, Australia's emissions will rise massively, and this will be a ticking climate bomb. This is ecocide. The International Energy Agency has warned us to reach net zero by 2050, there should be no more coal, oil, or gas projects. The Greens will not stand by and watch the Liberal Nationals destroy country and plunge us faster into a climate emergency. We know that Australia must take responsibility for our role in the climate crisis with a serious plan to bring down Australia's carbon emissions. And that means no more coal and gas. And which side is the so-called opposition party taking? In August 2021, the Morrison government, supported by Labor, voted to give 50 million of public money to oil and gas corporations to open up the Beetaloo. No amount of actual science or the climate disasters that we have been witnessing in our own backyard, the fires, the floods, the heat waves. Nothing seems to convince the Liberals and Labour that digging up fossil fuels is dangerous in the extreme. It is killing us. It is destroying our livelihoods, our communities, and our planet. The Beetaloo slush fund stinks of corruption and will be deadly for our climate. This gas rot has already given millions to Minister Taylor's mates. Empire Energy was handed out 21 million to drill at three sites in Beetaloo, despite still waiting on environmental approvals for the Northern Territory government. Surely, Labor can see the problems here. Surely, Labor can see the stench of corruption, the influence of big corporate money here. It's clear that the Liberals don't give a damn about climate change, or democracy for that matter. But I expected better from Labor, but sometimes, you do wonder why you expect better from labor, because you are let down every single time. If you don't want to stop fracking the Beetaloo Basin, if you can't support an end to coal and gas, then you don't really want to tackle the climate crisis. Then all the rest are just empty words. It's all mere theater. And through you, acting deputy president, in the last minute that I have, I do want to wish everyone a restful, rejuvenating, and relaxing holiday season. It has been a very tough two years, so I hope that we can all enjoy a little break with our loved ones. And happy Festivus, everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Faruqi. And the question is that the motion moved by Senator Faruqi that the Senate take note of questions asked by Senator Cox of, of Minister Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it.